Welcome. In this video, we are looking at the CCMP version 8 uh, curriculum enterprise focusing on core networking. This is going to be the first of two uh, video series. Again, this is focusing on int core. Welcome to chapter 25, securing network access control. So this is going to be more of our understanding network security, security design. We're going to be talking about endpoint protection, endpoint security. We're going to bring up a little bit about NAC. We're going to be essentially talking ways to do ACLs, but not quite as direct as we should be. So this is the precursor chapter to actually setting up and configuring ACLs. So this chapter is setting up the pretense to understanding of security threats. So let's go ahead and let's jump right on in. First of all, endpoints are extremely vulnerable to any type of security threat, mainly because there's people behind them. So we're not always talking about infections, we're talking basic social engineering. Uh, normally I ask you know, people, what's the easiest way to get someone's password? And the answer normally is to ask them. And the sad part is, this happens all the time. Not just that, when we're talking endpoint devices, how often do we get uh, um, links or phishing emails or emails that look legit, but they provide us things to download? The issue is, almost all of the time, not all the time, majority of the time, we can have our systems hijacked by clicking on a link. I actually recently had the same discussion with a close friend who kept getting text messages and they kept clicking on the link and I'm like, hey, you can be infecting your device by doing that, so be careful. Endpoints are extremely vulnerable to being infected, so pay attention. So to address this, Cisco created a um, safe type environment. It's basically a security architecture framework that helps to design secure solutions that following uh, places in, in the network. So when we're talking pins, that is placement in the network. We have things like branches, campuses, data centers, edges, our WANs, our clouds. So the nice thing is we can discuss safety based off of these locations. So the safe focuses on the integration of security services within each of the pins. For information on the underlying network design or infrastructure, Cisco will validate design guides. They're called CVDs. These guides provide the detailed design and implementation guidance, and you can normally find them at Cisco's website by doing cisco.com forward slash go forward slash CVD. Half the time I can't find it that way, I normally just Google Cisco plus CVD. That's probably an easier way to uh, get to it. So the nice thing is my background is originally I was a CCDP, I was a design professional. So when I designed my architecture of my network, it always took a, um, a security standpoint. Now they've uh, taken that and they've wrapped the design into some of the other core curriculum. So some of what you talk uh, now in the CCMP uh, focuses on the route switch or enterprise uh, area, focus pretty heavily on the design uh, aspect because it turns out you can know all the advanced topics you want, but if you can't design it securely, then there are problems. And that's part of what the, the, the key, the, the safe is actually supposed to be implementing. So we have things like management, security intelligence, compliance, segmentation, threat defense, and secure services. Those are the key prongs where we're going to be using and evaluating our pins. The nice thing is when we're looking at the Cisco safe, we're also looking at it before, during, and after. That way we can ensure that we are correctly providing the appropriate response to those key areas. So again, implementing the framework in the organization does provide some advanced threat defense protection that spans the entire attack cycle. Again, before, during, and after an attack. So if we're looking at the different pins, before the action. We could be looking at things like firewalls or network access controls. If we're looking at during the attack, we can be looking at different uh, IPSs. 
filtering using either web or email security. And after the attack, that's going to be more of the uh, contain and remediate. That's going to be things like advanced malware protection and behavioral analysis and then security analytics. That way we can ensure that we are safe once again. So an interesting thing is you're going to keep seeing this whole NG. You'll see that you have NGIP, NGFW. Cisco One is very, very big with acronyms. NG is just next generation. And you're going to start seeing things like NGE. Because the next chapter is about NGEs. Next generation endpoint. So to be able to detect and rapidly uh, deal with evolving threats, we need to design a network to use a security framework that provides safe environment. That's why Cisco pushes the Cisco safe. The following section, we're going to be looking at the uh, critical components needed to implement safe. And we're going to be looking at how to do that on a campus environment using the appropriate pins in the safe uh, arena. We're also going to be covering safe terminology. So Cisco is really big with some of the new uh, cutting edge security uh, appliances. Cisco also has what's called Talos. Talos is the threat intelligence organization. It's an elite team of experts. So it's not always about technology. Sometimes it's about the human capital. Talos is part of that human ca uh, capital. They are here to support sophisticated security systems. They aid in the creation of threat intelligence that both detect, analyze, and protect against both known and emerging threats, zero type days. The Cisco Talos was created from a combination of three security uh, big teams. That's going to be Iron Port Security, or SecApps, the Source Fire Vulnerability Research Team, VR Team, and the Cisco Threat Research Analysis and Communication Team, TRAC. So these three teams together combine to make Cisco Talos. Talos receives uh, valuable intelligence that no other security research team can match. That's kind of subjective, but it is what it is. So we have things that uh, the Talos follows certain other organizations and teams to keep sure that they are on the front line of vulnerable intelligence. So they follow things like the Advanced Microsoft and Industrial Disclosure, the Advanced Malware Protection Communities, the COMAV, SNORT Immunity, SAMCAP, so forth. They uh, feed through things like honeypots. They do source fire awareness education, guidance intelligence sharing programs. They do both private and public threat feeds, and they also do their own dynamic analysis. Some of the other things that they don't really discuss is they also work with fusion centers and other larger corporations to feed in intelligence data so they can make sure that they are staying on the front line of current and emerging threats. So since we said dynamic analysis, what about static analysis? Cisco also has what's known as the Cisco Threat Grid, and this is a solution that performs the static file analysis as well as dynamic file analysis, typically known as behavioral analysis. Essentially, by running the files in a controlled and very monitored environment, they can see what's going on. So, you think you have a phishing uh, email? Well, how do you know if it really is a phishing email if you don't actually bother to open it? Well, how do you know what it's going to do? You, you don't. You put it in a sandbox environment and you watch what it's capable of doing. And then from there, you know if it's good or bad or what other type of behavioral issues there are. So with that said, there are three main areas that the Cisco Threat Grid looks at. Behavioral analysis is a com uh, combined with the threat intelligence feeds from Talos, as well as this looks at security technologies to protect against those types of attacks, both known and unknown. It is also uh, possible to upload suspicious files to the internet to, to verify, looking at signatures, things like um, glove box to safely interact with them, or a virus total to, to scan them to see if there is. The goal here is looking to see if there is malware on a suspicious type of file. Threat Grid is an, uh, available as an appliance and in the cloud, kind of just depends on what you're wanting to pay for. Cisco security products and third-party solutions are also there for integration. 
it's not cheap. Normally these features are fairly expensive, however, they do work. So it is kind of a trade-off. So, automatic submission of suspicious files and samples are available for products and solutions that integrate with the Cisco Threat Grid. So, when automatic submission is not available, you can manually do it if you want to for analysis, both static and dynamically. So, let's go, let's talk about our AMP, Cisco Advanced Malware Protection or Advanced Malware Protection, AMP. It was formerly known as FireAmp. All of this basically is, it's a malware analysis tool and it provides protection solutions that go beyond point in time detection. Cisco AMP provides comprehensive protection, uh, again, for the full uh, spectrum of the attack before, during, and after. That way they can provide certain things like intelligence before, uh, during, they can look at file route, reputable rotation, determine if a file is clean or malicious, or after the attack we can do uh, more retro inspection, indicators of compromise, breach detection, analysis, tracking, and other uh, remediations of the attack post-attack. So part of Cisco AMP components are going to be things such as AMP for the cloud, both public and private, AMP connectors, that's going to be basic endpoint connectors for end devices, uh, Windows, Mac, Android, iOS, Linux, and so forth. There are network appliances that use AMP, uh, NG firewalls, NG IPSs, and the new uh, integrated service routers. Uh, I always love that. ISRs, routers. We have uh, things like email and our web based clients. That's going to be our ESAs and WSAs. And lastly, there is AMP for the Meraki product line. Meraki is owned by Cisco, and they have an entire Cisco subtree of appliances that are all just Meraki brand. So Threat Intelligence from the Talos group and Threat Grid provides additional layers of protection, all aimed to protect the organization. Cisco AMP for endpoints, uh, things like on the iOS, are also known as security connectors or Cisco security connectors, CSCs. These CSCs incorporate AMP for endpoint and Cisco umbrella based technologies. So here we have an example of our AMP components. We have an AMP threat cloud manager, that's gonna be our threat grid. And we have an appliance that actually uh, sees it. We have our umbrella uh, operations, things like AMP for email, AMP for network, AMP for Meraki and so forth, AMP for endpoints. And they all funnel back to this threat intelligence cloud so that they can have up-to-date current information on current threats. And part of this AMP cloud is also gonna bring in details from Palos. So now that we've talked about some of the basic endpoint protections, we can talk about some of the technologies Cisco has, things like the Cisco AnyConnect. Uh, the AnyConnect is a mobile VPN client that normally operates either through TLS or SSL, and it uses the IPsec uh, Ike version 2, but it also offers enhanced security through various built-in modules, such as things like the VPN posture, host scan module, and the ISE's post module module as well. Basically, AnyConnect is the SSL uh, mobile client for Cisco VPN technologies. AnyConnect includes things like web security through the web cloud security architecture, network visibility into the endpoint and the flaw, and the flow of information uh, within that endpoint within StealthWatch. It also helps with things like roaming protections with the Cisco umbrella technologies. In, uh, the AnyConnect is supported on almost any type of mobile device. The TLS and SSL is offered to indicate whether the protocol has been discussed and enabled. The SSL protocol has been uh, depreciated by the uh, EATF in favor of the more secure TLS. Even though we keep calling it an SSL VPN, it's normally a TLS VPN. It's just SSL has been around a little bit longer, so it just kind of depends on the age of the individual that you're discussing it with. Many people determined that TLS was SSL version 4, but they dropped that 
a name and you stuck with TLS to get away from the older con concept of SSL to begin with. We have Cisco Umbrella, which was formerly known as OpenDNS. This provides the first line of defense against threats by internet by blocking requests to malicious internet destinations. If, for example, the DNS is taking you to a known uh, bad uh, location, Cisco Umbrella, using uh, OpenDNS, blocks those links. They no longer are allowing that link to go through because it has been determined to be a malicious based link. It's 100% cloud delivered with no hardware or in software to install. The Umbrella Global Network includes 30 data centers around the world and it allows for 100% uptime. Essentially, they bought OpenDNS so that they could run OpenDNS. So, moving on, we have things like our WSAs, or our web security appliances. The before functionality, we're looking at web, web uh, reputation filters, web filtering, and our application and visibility and controls. If an attack does happen, we're going to be looking at our AMP file reputation. That's going to include things like our cloud access security, our antivirus, our layer 4 traffic monitoring, our file reputation and analysis with Cisco AMP, and our data loss prevention based tools. If the attack continues, we have our after cleanup. We have our continuous inspection for instances of undetected malware and breaches, and our global threat analytics, GTAs. Again, this is just the flow of how something would happen. If there is an issue, the cleanup actually does happen in the during and after. However, the entire goal of using the WSAs is to prevent these issues from arising in the first place. So again, as we break down this process, the before the attack, we're looking at things like the web uh, uh, reputation, our web filtering, our visibility, then controls. Uh, essentially, all of these help us to detect if these are possible uh, vulnerable files or possible attacks or malicious content coming from the web. So during the attack, again, we're looking at like cloud access security, making sure that there are no hidden threats in cloud apps. We're looking at AV, uh, advanced AV with malware protection. We're looking at monitoring uh, layer for traffic. And we're looking at our file rep uh, reputation based off of files that are using a uh, current information from Talos. We end it with our, during the attack phase, our loss prevention, our DLPs. And again, since our web security appliance is using ICAP, we integrate that with our DLP solution, and this is going to be the leading third-party uh, vendors for our DLP. All of this is about being able to provide protection during an attack. Post-attack, uh, again, after the attack, Cisco has inspection tools uh, for verifying and all of that. Uh, we also have things like the global threat analytics, um, both hybrid functions, so we could have a cloud deployment, virtual appliance, on-premise, or hybrid of all of the, uh, the above. All of this helps in aiding to ensure that the attack is actually over and then verifying uh, what happened and verifying that the systems are now clean or at least verifying that no one else is calling out to internet based resources. So once we deal with our web, we have our email. We have an email security appliance, ESA. A huge part with our ESA is that they are going to include things like advanced threat protection that allows you to detect, block, and remediate threats uh, throughout the entire system. Again, before, during, and after an attack. We uh, leverage things like the uh, threat intelligence, spam protection, reputation filter, and forged email detection. So what's interesting is with forged email detection, it also looks at things uh, against like uh, business email compromise attacks, BECs, because they are growing as well. That way they can start protecting executives against these types of attacks.
or management more specifically. So we also have things like our advanced phishing protection, our domain protection, malware defense by, via email detection, gray mail detection and unsafe subscribers. The ESAs detect and classify gray mail from an administrator to take action uh, if necessary. Essentially it, it alerts our administrator to ensure that they are not blocking mail that should not be blocked. We also have things like URL related protection. You can remove URLs or disable URLs in content if uh, it's deemed uh, malicious. We have things like outbreak filters, uh, web interaction uh, tackling. Again, that's going to be more like web-based reports based off of flaws, like typical users who click on malicious links, top malicious URLs being sent, dates and times and re uh, rewrite reasons that are taken out of the URLs. That way you can kind of start uh, homing in your training of your staff. Lastly, we have our data security for sensitive content for outgoing email. So the fun part is it's not always about what email is being received. Sometimes it's about what email is being sent. Confidential outbound messages that match a specific policy should be protected and blocked. For example, with Office 365, you can set up email encryption, email alerts for content that is found in violation of certain policies. Oh, you're emailing a social security number. Nope, not allowed. And they can be blocked. If you have the data security and sensitive content filtering configured and turned on. Moving on, we have our next generation uh, IPS. It's essentially an IPS with next generation functions. Things like real-time contextual awareness, better threat protection, better use of intelligent security automation, better performance, and lastly, it does use the application visibility and control ABCs and better filtering. So our advanced uh, IPSs actually take root of these real-time based components that Talos and our threat grid can provide us. So with the acquisition of SourceFire, about seven years ago, Cisco added the firepower of the next generation IPS to its profile. We've already talked about things like its real-time contextual awareness, but some of the advanced features are centralized management, better IPS uh, using Snort, high availability, and better integration with third-party and open source-based ecosystems. Moving past our next generation IPSs, we have our next generation firewalls. Our next generation firewalls block threats, things like advanced malware and application layer attacks are where the next generation firewall really shines. It's no longer just filtering off the source destination and layer three. It is now doing layer three, layer four, and layer seven base protection. The next generation firewall does integrate a IPS. It does also look at application inspection. And it also has the ability to leverage external security intelligences to address the growing security cli uh, climate. Part of our next generation firewall management also includes things like Firepaw uh, Firepower's Management Center, Device Manager for mobile devices and small appliances, and we still have the ASA-based software, that CLI, or still using the Cisco Security Manager, or the SDMs. So you have options now for management, whether it be the FTD or through a ASA-based software. So let's go ahead and let's look at this Fire Power Management Center. So the FMC is centralized management. It's a platform that allows you to aggregate and correlate threats. We're not going to call it a SIM, even though it may do a lot of similar SIM-based functions, but it's more than just that. It ties in and correlates, contextualizes data, and it looks at network device performance information. The FMC does perform event and policy management through different solutions, looking at things like the Cisco Firepower, next generation firewalls and virtual appliances, 
next generation IPSs and virtual appliances, next uh, generation threat defense or ISRs, ASAs, and other AMP uh, base protection. When we talked about AMP, we brought up the concept of Stealth Watch. Stealth Watch has two main features, Enterprise or Cloud. They're the big two offerings now. Stealth Watch is a collector that also aggregates network to, uh, telemetry data that performs on the network security analysis and monitoring. Basically, all of this is brought together to automatically detect, threat, and manage, infiltrate network as well as from the original uh, network standpoint. It's an analyzer. That's what this really is. It's an analyzer used to automate some of these protections so that the monitoring automatically will detect threats and notify someone based off of a predefined criteria, whether it be take actions based off of Talos or a administrator's flow. That's what it does. For Stealth Watch Enterprise, it is a license, but we can deal with things like the flow rate license, flow collector uh, console, flow sensors. You're going to notice here the big thing is flow. You also have additional components like threat intelligence, endpoint, and cloud. All of these features are geared towards providing real time visibility into activities currently go over the network. So it's also a network monitor. Benefits are going to be real-time detection, incident response and forensics uh, post-attack, network segmentation. That's not really a uh, an issue with this. Like that's not a benefit. That's just it helps or it aids in network segmentation, and it does actually help with performance and capacity planning. If you have a better view of how the flow of data is happening through your network then you can start planning where you need to do your upgrades. We also have things like our flow rate licenses we've already talked about. All of this is basically allowing for understanding the flow of data through the network. So that is our Stealth Watch Enterprise. Let's go ahead and talk about Stealth Watch Cloud. So we have our Stealth Watch Cloud, which does public cloud monitoring and private network monitoring. The cloud provides the visibility and continual threat detection required to secure both on-premise, hybrid, and multi-cloud environments. So, this doesn't mean that this tool is in the cloud. This tool is used to actually monitor your cloud. Whether you're using AWS or Google or uh, Azure, it doesn't matter on the cloud infrastructure. If you're dealing with a private network, uh, again, Cisco StealthWatch Cloud Private network monitoring is also providing visibility in those areas. StealthWatch Cloud consumes metadata only, so the actual packet payloads are never actually retained or transferred outside of that network. So do keep that in mind. So we have our ICE, our Cisco Identity Service Engine. So part of our ICE is it's a security policy management platform, and it provides basically the entry-level uh, access to our NAC, Network Access Control. This is basically allowing users and devices across the network and across VPNs uh, to provide certain levels of management. So ICE features streamlined network visibility, part of the network architecture, center integration, secure, uh, securing network access control, centralizing that access control, providing things like Cisco uh, trust, lifecycle management, device profiling, posturing, Active Directory support, and more. So what does all this mean? Reality, when you connect your device to the network, what happens? Well, your device may just be granted access. Well, what happens if that device is malicious? What, what happens if that device has an out-of-date service pack for Windows, or is an older version of Windows, or has no updated antivirus, or doesn't even have an antivirus. So that's where the posturing and device profiling comes into play. NAC can be set so that if a device comes online and it doesn't have a matching security profile, 
it's isolated. That way, it can interact with other network devices that can only interact with the internet. Or maybe it's programmed to pull current information so that it can become up to date and gain access to the rest of the network resources. It really just depends. Here's an example of the contextual information that Cisco ICE can be used to share uh, information through its PX grid. So let's dive a little bit deeper into our NAC. Again, this section is about being able to configure NAC technologies such as 802.1x, a MAB, our WebAuth, as well as things like our next generation NAC technologies like TrustSec and MacSec. So jumping in is 802.1x. This standard is for port-based security, PNAC, and it provides authentication mechanisms for LANs and WANs to authenticate devices coming on. 802.1x comprises of uh, typically EAP, an extended authentication protocol. Basically, this is the message format or the framework defined by the RFC for providing encapsulation transport for authentication parameters. We have different EAP methods, EAP types essentially. These are going to be the different types of authentication methods that can be used. We have EAP over LAN. This is a layer 2 protocol for our, the encapsulation protocol for our 802.1x standard. There's also an EAP message for 802.2 for wired and separate for our wireless based networks. Essentially here, we're going to be tying in radius protocols so that we can tie in AAA functions using EAP. So what is this, the roles? With our 802.1 network devices, there are three main roles. Supplicant, Authenticator, and Authenticator Server. The Supplicant is the software on the endpoint. The Authenticator is basically the network device or a LAN controller that's going to be used to manage the authentication status of the endpoint or of the supplement. And then we have the authentication server. That's typically going to be radius or tac -axe. So in the diagram, you're going to notice we have things like EAP over LAN or EAP OL. And then we have a radius. That way, our device connects to a switch. The switch actually verifies the authentication through radius. The radius authentication process normally is a three-step process. And it involves identifying exchanging the authentication uh, mechanisms between the end device and the authenticator, between the supplicant and the authenticator server, essentially. So, step one, the initiation. The uh, authenticator notices a port come online. It starts the authentication process by sending a periodic EAP request or identifying frame. Step two is the actual authentication portion. The authenticator will reply with EAP messages between the supplicant and the authentication server. And you'll notice in the diagram, it's a process. It's not just a single packet. It's normally a three-step pro process between the supplicant, authenticator, and between the authenticator and the authentication service, again, three-step process between each of those devices. Lastly, assuming everything checks out, the authentication is successful, the authentication server should return a access accept message to the authenticator. The authenticator will forward that to the endpoint, the supplicant, and authorization is essentially allowed. Sadly, we don't have a lab in Packet Tracer walking through this process because Packet Tracer and 802.1x just has some struggle. But I know that Cisco is working on a way to actually uh, inspect this process. Anyways, moving on, we have our EAP methods. We have an EAP as a challenge based authentication using MD5. That's going to be EAP MD5. We have an EAP versus TLS authentication method. That's going to be EAP TLS. We have tunneling TLS methods, and that's going to be either EAP fast, EAP T T T L S, or P EAP. And P EAP has actually been around for a little while, and it's probably not the better option. If we're having to do tunnel TLS, something like EAP 
fast, it's probably gonna be a better option. We also have internal or inner authentication methods. We have eat generic token cards, so eat GTP, uh, GTC. We also have things like eat using Microsoft, that's gonna be eat MS chat v2. And then lastly, we have our eat TLS. Uh, I do not believe that we have eat uh, MS chat v1, that's no, no longer approved. So it's just gonna be uh, the Microsoft chat v2 from uh, now on. So basically we have some basic descriptions looking at some of the more popular uh, forms. Eat v5 uses the MD5 algorithm to hide the credentials in a hash. Eat TLS is using PKI. PEEP only authenticates server requires a certificate. So PEEP forms the encrypted TLS tunnel and the supplicant and the authentication server. Nice thing with PEEP is after the tunnel has been established, people use a EAP authentication of inner method so that you can provide the additional information. So part of the inner authentication method for the supplicant through the outer PEEP TLS tunnel types, the authentication methods for PEEP are going to be MSCHAP, uh, EAP GTC, EAP TLS, EAP TLS Fast, or EAP TTLS. And then with CHAP and GTC, there are different versions of that. So EAP GTC is actually now known as PEEP V1, and EAP uh, MS CHAP is now PEEP version 0. So moving on, we have our EAP chaining. Essentially, this is going to be part of our EAP Fast. Uh, EAP chaining is a part of our EAP fast. It supports machines and user authentication inside a outer TLS tunnel. It enables machines and user authentication to be combined into a single overall authentication result, not having to, re end uh, not having to authenticate each portion, but the entirety. This allows assignment of a greater privilege posture or assessment to, to users who connect to the network using corporate managed devices. So the managed device is going to allow for the EAP fast function using the single outer TLS tunnel. It's using the tunnel, so there's already a certain level of trust that has been established. We have our MAC authentication bypass, MAB, and essentially this is an access control technique that enables port-based access using MAC addresses. How does it work? First of all, the initiation of 802.1x timeout. The authenticator will send our EAP requests or our request identities. They will be timed out. The MAC authentication it will send a packet to the authenticator. The authenticator will take the receiving packet, notice the MAC address, and then send a radius access request to the either radius device or the Cisco ICE device. The Cisco ICE device, if allowed, will return with the appropriate message. That's going to be the authorization functionality. So the MAC addresses are easily spoofed for that reason. MAB authentication endpoints are given very restrict access control and should only be allowed to communicate on the network and services that the endpoints are actually required to, to need. Basically, we have things like downloadable ACLs or dynamic VLAN assignment or security group tags, SGT-based tags. All of this basically means that the endpoint is going to be segregated so that they cannot be interacting with other devices. That is the design preference. However, that's not what's always done, but that is definitely a tool that should be deployed. We have our web-based authentication, WebAuth, very similar to MAB, but is used as a fallback authentication mechanism to 802.1x. So it's a fallback option, it's a backup option. 802.1x is the primary. If both MAB and WebAuth are configured as fallbacks for 802.1x, when 802.1x times out, it will switch to the first attempts to authenticate through MAB, and then if MAB can't do it, it will use WebAuth. Unlike MAB though, WebAuth is only used for users and not devices since it requires a web browser and 
manually have to type in a username and password entry. Like most devices, WebAuth allows for either local accounts or a centralized web authentication account that's accessible through Cisco ICE. However, you can tie Active Directory into the WebAuth uh, using Cisco ICE, so it's a centralized account when appropriately configured. So what do we mean by local web authentication? Basically, this is the first form of WebAuth, and the switch or wireless controller will redirect web traffic, HTTP or HTTPS, to a locally hosted web portal running on the switch. That way the switch can actually verify the end user can enter a username and password, and then the switch will send those credentials on behalf of the user to the web authenticator. The web authenticator web portal are not customizable in the Cisco realm. However, a lot of other vendors do allow for customized web portals, food for thought. The Cisco switch is not native supported for advanced services such as acceptable use policies, acceptable pages, password changes capability, device registration, and other things. So the web authenticator doesn't support VLANs, it doesn't support in devices, it supports users. So security is only focused on the ACL assignment. Web authenticators don't support challenge authentication either. So things like new policies aren't really there. So if there are changes that are made or you're having to quarantine in a device, web authentication is not always the best tool. Web authentication can also be tied to ICE. That is now called Centralized Web Authenticator, CWA, and this overcomes a lot of the deficiencies used by our local authenticators. CWA does allow for posturing, does allow for VLANing, does allow for more dynamic uh, ACLs. It also allows for the advanced features like provisioning, posturing, uh, acceptable use changes, self-registration, device registration, and more. Just like our local, our centralized management only is for endpoints that have web browsers because again, here we're authenticating the web user, the user on the web, not the device on the web. With the CWA and WebAuth, guest VLAN functions will remain mutually exclusive. So how do we do this? How do we set it up? First of all, trying to get a hold of a ICE software package to, to practice on is not the easiest option. It's just, it's a challenge. So they walk you through the steps, but they don't actually give you the hands-on that's necessary to complete this task. The authentication for our centralized web authenticator is a slightly different from our local. The following steps detail on how it happens. First step, the endpoint enters the network, doesn't have to be configured with a supplement or supplement is misconfigured. The switch will perform MAB, sending the appropriate radius access request to the ICE the authenticator server, ICE, sends the radius results, including the URL redirect, to the centralized portal on the ICE server itself. The endpoint is assigned an address, DNS server, and gateway using DHCP, temporarily and allowing limited access. The end user opens a web browser, enters their credentials into the centralized web portal. ICE sends a reauth challenge to do a call reauth to the switch. The last step is the switch will send a new MBA re request with the same session ID to the ICE, and if appropriate, the ICE will send the final authorization results to the switch for the end user. The switch will then grant the end user access if allowed. There are some flexible auth or flex auth options. By default, Cisco switches configured with 802.1x uh, MBAB and WebAuth also attempt the authentication using 802.1x first, then MAB, then WebAuth. That's the order of operations. If an endpoint that doesn't support 802.1x tries to connect to the network, it needs to wait for the time for WebAuth to actually connect. There are timers in place and steps, so it's a waiting game. Nice thing is, with NX FlebAuth, 
This basically refers to as a access session manager address, and it addresses this issue by allowing multiple authenticator methods to concur uh, to occur concurrently. So we can do 802.1x and MAP at the same time, so that the endpoint can authenticate and be brought online a little quicker, not having to wait two or three minutes for WebAuth to actually be processed. Enhanced FlexAuth is a key component to the identity-based network services, IBNS, integration solution. You're going to definitely learn more about this aspect in the CCMP security uh, track. The IBNS2 integration solution offers authentication, access control, and user profile enforcement. IBNS2 allows for better enhanced FlexAuth. It provides Cisco ICE and looks at the common classification policy language, C3PL. All of this basically allows for the integrated solution that offers everything that we need in one to allow for a common end-to-end -end access policy that applies both to wired and wireless-based devices. All right, so moving on, we have our Cisco TrustSec. TrustSec is a next generation uh, access control enforcement solution developed by the group of Cisco to address growing things operational challenges about being able to maintain firewall rules and ACLs by using security group tags instead. Security group tags are SGT tags. So TrustSec will use a GCT tag to perform ingress and egress tagging. These uh, ingress and egress filtering allows for enforcement of access control policies. Using Cisco ICE assigns the SGT tag to where users or the device that is successfully authenticated and authorized by uh, either 802.1x or through MAP or through WebAuth. The tag itself is an assignment basically it means to deliver to the authenticator as an authorized option in the same way as like a dynamic ACL would be used. So after the tag is assigned and access enforcement policies either allowed or dropped based off of the tag. Again, the tag can be applied either to the ingress port of a TrustSec network or an egress port. An ingress or egress, it doesn't really matter if it's coming or going but you can tag them as it comes uh, leaves our network. The SGC tags represent the context of the user, the device, the use case, or function. Basically, that means the tags are often named after particular roles or business case use. Tags are referred to as scalable group tags in our SD access. So essentially, we're, we're tagging and our groups, essentially. A lot of other appliances, a lot of other vendors with their appliances already do tagging, but now Cisco started moving into the realm of tagging as well. So in this uh, diagram, you can see that they are tagging different groups. We have a name, we have a hex or a decimal number, and we have a description. TrustSec configuration occurs in three main phases, ingress classification, propagation, and egress enforcement. That way we can make sure to tag our information correctly. So our ingress classification is the process of assigning a tag to a user, endpoint, or other resource as they ingress the network. This can happen one of two ways, either dynamic assignment or static assignment. A static assignment, you can do things like subnets or VLANs or any layer 2 or layer 3 uh, connection can be tagged automatically. Uh, dynamically, basically, the tag is assigned dynamically and can be downloaded as an authorized option from the ICE server when authenticated. As an alternate to assigning a tag to a port, Cisco ICE, can add the ability to centrally configure a database of addresses and their corresponding tags. So essentially, this address, whether it be a layer 2 address or a layer 3 address, can be stored in a database that says, oh, this IP address is this tag. 
That way the tag itself doesn't have to be applied to all packets. But again, this all means additional configuration and scalability and configuration of our Cisco ICE appliance. The next section would be segmentation, or sorry, not segmentation, propagation. So when we're looking at propagation and we're looking at a ethernet frame, we have some values that we can add. Basically, we have a 16-bit namespace for our tag value. This is called an inline tagging, and it's inserted uh, the tag inside a frame to allow for upstream devices to read and apply the appropriate policy. This is going to be the, the one way. The other method is going to be the SGT exchange proto uh, protocol, SXP. The inline tagging is basically native tagging, that's the default. But with our XXP propagation, basically it's a TCPA's peer-to-peer -peer protocol, and it's used for networking devices that don't support our inline tagging or our hardware. Basically, non-inline tagging switches will have a SGT map database to check the packets against the appropriate policy. The SXP peer basically sends an IP to tag binding called a speaker. The IP to uh, SGT binding receiver is called a listener. So our peer that's sending the bindings speaker the one that's receiving the binding is called the listener. Our XSP connections can be a single hop or multi hop as shown in our diagram. All of this is basically where are the tags stored. If we have a bunch of legacy devices that don't allow for our tagging, we can do SXP propagation and we can have a speaker on the network that actually hands out the appropriate address mapping, address to tagging function. So let's look at our propagation a little bit better. Here we have our addresses, we have our tag, and we have a source. It's also shown that a in, in this example, the switch basically is not capable of inland tagging so that it uses SXP instead to update the upstream switch. In both of these cases, the upstream uh, switch will continue to track the traffic throughout the, you know, throughout the infrastructure. So even though a device is not able to tag it appropriately, you will see that, you know what, I'm going to use my pin. This one can't handle inland. So what we're doing is we are using our speaker to actually forward that data to a listener. That listener will listen for the source destination information and then tag it appropriately. Down here, this is actually inline. So as the data flows to our device, so our switch, our switch tags it with our tag right here in our frame. The tags stay throughout the entire network. So you can see both tags, as it flows through the next set of switches, actually have the appropriate tag. That just means that propagation lives throughout the entire device. Instead of having the device's handle, we can have ICE handle it. So ICE becomes the speaker. ICE keeps the database. ICE sends the uh, information out to the listeners, as opposed to the hardware having to do it. So now let's look at egress enforcement. So after the tags have been assigned or classified, and after they've been transmitted across the network or propagated, policies can be enforced to the, at the ingress point of the TrustSec network. If you have content that is internal only, we can set a way to prevent that tagged data from leaving the network. So there are multiple ways to enforce this. There are two main types. We can do security group ACLs or SGACLs, or we can do a security group firewall. 
which we already know is security group uh, firewall basically takes our ACEs and ACLs and actually applies them. So this is kind of a little bit weird. Basically, we can either do it as a hardware appliance or we can do an ACL on an, a device that is able to handle the tagging. So again, in this example, we have our source destination sent to a support device. The support device isn't capable of handling our speaker mode, so it actually forwards it out to Cisco ICE. Cisco ICE is going to act as the speaker, so it will forward the appropriate data to the listener. The listener will take the information, things coming from 10.1.1.1, attach that tag, and so the listener will apply this tag to anything with that source. So our new frame will have source destination matching tag because of the source in, uh, information. As it flows through the network and it wants to leave the network, we have an end device that is capable of doing either security group ACLs or security group firewalls that is set to block egress of anything tag one uh, using that, that tag. So that destination will uh, matches that block that tag matches so it doesn't focus on the destination itself it's focusing on the tag that destination is a valid and reachable destination however because of the ACL it will not be allowed to continue on and this is an example of security group ACLs off of a egress enforcement just like anything else, AC, uh, an SGACL is set up to permit or deny or remark traffic, and it needs to be filtered. Pr uh, the actual order here matters. So in this example, we're looking at an SGACL permit uh, configuration, which is only allowing FTP and denying all other traffic. So here we're looking at employees using 0004 it basically is denying everything but allowing FTP based traffic. So in a enforcement example we can actually see that we can block certain material based off of just the tags and again here we have things like employee versus developer tag. It all depends on who is sending the data. So this uh, diagram illustrates the scenario where only one tag or one group is allowed to send the data. And that's going to be the developer, but only from the developer server, not from the workstations. So we build out our matrix, we have our user types, our tag types on one side, and we have our device classification on the other side. Devices, where's my pen? Yeah, these are devices, these are tags. So if there's an employee and an employee, it is supposed to be only allowing for FTP. However, it won't be allowed to egress. If the developer is sending it from a employee workstation, no. If an employee is trying to send stuff from the development server, no. The developer is only allowed to send FTP data when they're logged in to the development server. That's the only way FTA, uh, FTP data will be allowed to leave. So this is an example that allows us to illustrate that FTP is the only protocol in this example allowed between the employees while any other type of traffic is blocked. So the employees connect to the same switch and the switch is acting as an ingress and egress point. So you can communicate between the different employees using FTP, but it can't leave the network. And the, the switches are acting as both ingress and egress. Moving on, we have our MAC security. MAC security is an 802.1AE standard layer two base encryption method hop by hop. This is a new 
set of protocols, well, newer. The traffic is basically encrypted on the wire between two MacSec peers, and it's unencrypted as it processes internally within the switch. This allows the switch to look in the inner packet of the things like tags to form the appropriate enforcement. Whether if it's tag enforcement, packet enforcement, QoS prioritization, it doesn't matter. It's looking to verify the appropriate policies and comply with them. MacSec also leverages onboard ISIC controllers, ASCII controllers, to perform the encryption and decrypt rather than having to offload to a crypto-based engine such as IPsec does. With MacSec, it is based on Ethernet frame format, but there is also an additional 16-byte MacSec security flag in the header. So 802.1 AE header is slightly different than a traditional 802.3 header. And the header also allows for a 16-byte integrity check value, ICV, they were also added. So MacSec provides authentication using a new method, a glorious method authentication code, or through our standard glorious counter mode advanced encryption standard, AES, GMCM. All of this is basically how do we authenticate and how much content is being encrypted through the network. What device can actually take the encrypted data and decrypt it appropriately so that it can read the appropriate material. Here's an example of how our 802.1 AC header would look like. You'll notice we have our traditional header, but we also have a 802.1 AE header that provides additional content like ETH type, our uh, packet numbering, our SCI options, and other security uh, groups. And then within the encrypted aspect, the encrypted portion of the MAC, we have our CMD section that also offers a ETH type version, a length, options, and our tagged values. So again, when a switch receives this type of packet, the switch has to be able to decrypt it so it can look at the encrypted portion and understand the tags. So the tag types are things like the ETH type, the first two octets, designate the frame as a MACSEC frame. We have a TCI AN that's in the uh, third octet. It's a tag control information association number. Basically this is designed the version number if confidential or integrity is being used on its own. We have a SL or short length filled in the fourth octet. This is basically designating the length of the encrypted data. We have a packet number in the octets five through eight. This is the packet number for relaying protection and building of the uh, initialization vector. We have a secure channel indicator, SCIs in octets nine through 16 for classifying the connections to the virtual points. And we have two types of MACSEC keying mechanisms. We have our SAP, Security Association Protocol, and we have a key agreement, or MACSEC key agreement. SAP is Cisco proprietary. The key agreement provides the required session keys and manages the required encryption type, but it's not Cisco proprietary. Lastly, we have a download uh, link for our MACSEC. Basically, and this is the term that's used to describe the encrypted link between the endpoint and a switch. The encryption between the endpoint and the switch is handled by our key, uh, the uh, key assessment keying protocol. This does require a, a MACSEC capable switch, more money, and some type of supplement on the endpoint, normally something like using AnyConnect or a VPN. The encryption of the endpoint may be handled in the hardware or the software, it doesn't really matter, but keep in mind that it's going to be using the main CPU for encryption and decryption, so there are resource utilization issues that come into play. Cisco Switch has the ability to enforce encryption and make encryption option, or force a non-encryption, it just kind of depends. The settings are configured through ICE, and if ICE returns an encryption policy, 
with the authentication results, then the policy is issued by the ICE overrides anything set by the local switch. ICE will always take precedence in that regard. So lastly, we have an uplink for our MacSec. Basically, the uplinks are the encrypting links between the switch with 802.1 AE. By default, the uplink MacSec, you will use the proprietary SAP, and the encryption is using the same AES GCM with 128-bit encryption. And that's going to be used for both the uplink and download link. Remember, download link is connected to the end device to the switch, and the uplink is basically the link between the switches. Uh, but if you can't tell by the word uplink. Uplink MacSec basically is achieved manually or dynamically. Dynamically requires 802.1x authentication between the switches, or manually does not. And that is it for this chapter. There is a lot of content covered in this chapter, but sadly we don't get to use some of the features because we don't have the appropriate licenses. Topics we talked about were web and email security appliances, IPSs, Next generation versions, amps, umbrellas, AnyConnect, Cisco Talos, Cisco ThreatGrid, and so much more. We talked about several encryption standards, 802.1x, all of the components, all of the security mechanisms like EAP, EAP channeling, our different Cisco protocols, our things like our ICE, our identifying service managers, our MacSec, our BAB, our MABs, our firewalls, our web off, and so much more. And that is it for this chapter. I know there's a lot of content and there's not a lot of labs in this chapter. I'll see what I can do about some getting some applied hands-on for this material. But for now, if you have any questions or concerns, definitely feel free to reach out to me. I will try to break down any of the material that wasn't straightforward uh, a little bit better if necessary. Thank you and I look forward to working with you. If you have any questions or anything, please feel free to reach out. Again, with this material, being able to ask questions and discuss some of the topics in the lecture help build long-term retention, so do not be afraid to, to communicate with this topic. Again, I'm here if you need anything. Thank you.